Hey everybody, this is Scott Arnell, and welcome to this episode of the SRI 360 podcast, where in every episode I interview world-class, sustainable, and responsible investors, executives, or entrepreneurs who are driving positive change in the world while achieving market returns. And I do this in order to bring you the lessons that they've learned along the way from their investment activities and their experiences, and to find out what they are actually doing and how they are doing it so that you can have better insights into the different SRI investing strategies that are actually being done today and what they're actually doing right now and doing it across many different asset classes. And hopefully this will help you invest in a more purposeful way and to invest for positive impact for a better world through your investment activities. Now today, I'm speaking with Bram Boss, and that's spelled B as in boy, O-S. And Bram Boss is the lead portfolio manager of Green Bond Strategies, which is part of the specialized fixed income boutique at NN Investment Partners, which is based in The Hague in the Netherlands. If you want to know more about green bonds and the green bond market, you are going to be in for a treat today because Bram has been building the Green Bond franchise at NNIP since its inception in 2015. The strategy he manages includes four dedicated Green Bond funds and total assets under management for his Green Bond strategy are over 3.8 billion euros. Bram has more than 20 years of portfolio management experience, including different roles he previously held at Unilever, APG, Nomura, and Fullerton Fund Management. Previously, Bram was a member of the Fixed Income Advisory Committee for the United Nations back principles for responsible investment. He has a master's of science in financial economics from Erasmus University in Rotterdam. In our talk today, Bram takes us through how he started NNIP's green bond strategies back in 2015, right before interest in green bonds really exploded. We talk through what exactly qualifies as a green bond and what doesn't. We talk through who were his investors originally in the beginning and how that has changed over time. We talk about the ring fencing of proceeds from green bond issuances and the follow-up and engagement activities he does with issuers post issuance. And we talk a lot about the transparency he strives to achieve through green bond issuances. Bram talks a lot about how he analyzes issuances and determines whether or not to invest. He goes through some good examples of projects he has financed through green bonds, as well as some that he has invested in that turned out to be disappointments. He speaks about the benefits of investing in green bonds and the risks that are unique to green bond investors. He discusses the issues around green bond standards or lack thereof, as the case may be. And of course, we get into greenwashing and we talk about a whole lot more along the way. My conversation with Bram was insightful for me. It gave me some real clarity on this market, and I think you will find it interesting too. And now, please meet Bram Boss. So I'm currently lead portfolio manager for the Green Bond CG at NN Investment Partners. And NN Investment Partners is part of NN Group, one of the biggest insurance companies in the Netherlands. We manage funds and mandates for institutional retail investors, predominantly in fixed income. As a firm, the focus really has been a lot on responsible investing. I think that really has changed since about five years ago, but we already have been active in sustainable finance funds and mandates for over 20 years. So I am responsible responsible for the green bond strategy, which I also have been setting up since 2016. Early 2016, we launched our first green bond fund. It was, yeah, uh, how should I say it? The early, uh, it was a very early stage of the green bond market. Since then, we have been growing the strategy. We have been um, adding several other green bond funds. In total, we have four dedicated green bond funds now. We are also managing several mandates for pension funds, and the total assets under management in dedicated green bond strategies are currently around 4 billion euros. So it has grown from zero in 2016 to close to 4 billion. Just to give you a little bit more color, when I get every month an overview of all the RFPs from clients across NNIP, and by far, green bonds is the highest product in demand at the moment within NIP, by far, from everything what we're doing, also compared to other regular strategies. So it's very typical of how demand for sustainable finance is currently really exponentially growing. And I think that is also the, yeah, the case uh, for green bonds, and, and, but also other strategies are growing very quickly on our side in that space. Just to put things in context, to get a little more about your, your background and the path that you came to. You know, 
you, you went to university. You've yeah. you raised in the Netherlands and yeah. educated there and so forth. Yeah. So I was born in the north. Oh, no, I was born. I, I, most of my youth, I, I was in the north of the Netherlands. I studied in uh, Rotterdam at the Erasmus University. Yeah. When I graduated, I started to work at uh, APG, the largest uh, pension provider in the Netherlands, managing currency portfolios. I did that for about uh, four years. Then I moved to Singapore to take a job over there for Fullerton and Fund Management, which is a, a subsidiary of Temasek Holdings. I don't know if you know Temasek Holdings, but it's one of the two big sovereign wealth funds in uh, Singapore. How was that? Yeah, it was great. It was a great experience. I was the only Caucasian working among <laughs> Asians, which particularly in the, in the beginning was really challenging. It's yeah. a very different culture, different environment, but it was such a great experience in the end. And I really learned a lot also from other cultures, also from my own culture. What time frame was that? I moved there to 2005 and I left in the end in 2011, so a bit more than five years. Wow. And then you live, you live through the whole uh, Great Recession thing there. But then the, the call back to the Netherlands, huh? Yeah, I moved back to the Netherlands. And yeah, and Singapore is quite far from the Netherlands. And I always had the idea, yeah, if I have kids, I want to raise them in the Netherlands. And so we moved back in 2011 when I had two kids. Yeah. Started to work for Unilever pension funds, mm. managing yeah, several fixed income portfolios, monitoring and selecting external fixed income managers. But that was actually the first time I really got in touch with uh, sustainable finance. As you maybe know, Unilever is one of the corporates which has been very prominent in terms of sustainability. I think they launched a sustainable living plan really in the early days of sustainable as a theme for corporates. So they were really a front runner on that space. Yeah. So I started to, to get in touch with that. I started to manage the portfolios in a more sustainable way adding green bonds, trying to add companies which did better. And then in 2015, I moved to NN Investment Partners to, uh, to set up the green bond strategy. I think that was a very nice opportunity to go there. I already had some experience in terms of the green bonds and sustainable finance. And I think that was something they were looking for. And I got given that uh, on day one, not having any idea at all whether or not it would be a success or not. Yeah. But I think it turned to be quite, quite a strong momentum so far. So. It's right. been a great experience. I, I started on my own. I've uh, been building up the team. I think we have now five people working full time on, uh, on Green Bonds here. It's one of the biggest Green Bonds team uh, in the world. And, and yeah. it's been a great journey also in terms of personal development, I have to say, because it's yeah. the first time I'm really selling the products also commercially, facing clients, doing presentations, etc. So it's quite, quite an interesting journey. You're obviously a le leading Green Bond portfolio manager. And I think at one point you also served on the advisory committee for PRI, for fixed income as well. So you're right in the mainstream, main flow of sustainable and responsible investing. But you started out managing an FX portfolio and FX traders. And I know because I used to manage a corporate uh, book, not always known as the most philosophical thinkers. Not at all. I don't usually think about the long-term effects of, well, anything. And, and I can say that because I've worked in that. Take me how you got from there just mentally. Yeah, that's, that is, that's a real... That I think only considers the long-term effects. That, that's a real, real good question, actually. And a couple of months ago or a month ago, we also made a movie about our Green Bond team. And there were two different angles. I have a lady working in my team. All she breathes is green. She's something she always had wanted to do, but she never expected to be in finance. And for me, it's exactly the other way around. So I was always in finance. It was my dream to be in finance. And I turned to sustainable finance. So it's a very interesting mix of different people which we have in our team. So what triggered me in the end, I worked my last year in Singapore. I worked for a Japanese investment bank yeah. as a prop trader. And when I worked there, it was, from one hand, it was the most terrible experiences for my life in terms of uh, working career, but it also triggered a lot for me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what do you mean most terrible experiences? Yeah, I don't know if you worked at an investment bank, but I, I, <laughs> the, way, the way I was working there, at, it was a Nomura. People came in, they were just staring at the screen from eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in, in the afternoon, and that's it. You know, yeah. There was no socializing. 
Right. People are just there and exclusively to maximize as much as possible their own wealth and their own financial well-being. So I experienced that. It was terrible. I also really learned there in Singapore in that specific year because I also had some friends working there. And whenever they got a lot of money, they only want to have more and more. It seems yeah. the more they had, the more they wanted. And I thought, come on, it's, it's never enough, right? So I felt like, yeah, this is not what I want. Of course, I want to be successful in, in you know, and you know, earn good income. I also want to do good at the same yeah. time. So that triggered me a lot. And, and mm. yeah, that was also one of the reasons why I started to work at Unilever, where there was also a very strong focus on sustainable finance from one hand, and at the same time, still doing the same things I was doing before, fund management. Thanks for sharing that. That's a big part of trying to understand why you're doing what you're doing. So, okay, now green bonds, it's a big subject and, and yeah, we do have a limited amount of time. So I think you said your portfolio is something like 4 billion and you said you have four green bond funds. And I think you just launched one recently, a sovereign wealth fund. Can you just uh, give me a brief overview of the four different uh, funds and yeah. What are they and why are they? Yeah. So we have an, uh, the first green bond fund, which was launched in 2016. It's an aggregate green bond fund combining corporates, uh, covered bonds, supranationals, agencies, and government bonds. So it covers the whole fixed income space. Then we have a second green bond fund, which is actually similar, with the only difference is that we hedge the duration to only two years. So it's a short duration version. Okay. And I think. In the current environment, where people are very worried about rising interest rates, that is for some investors very attractive. Then we have the third green bond fund, which we launched in 2020, uh, which is focusing only on corporate green bonds. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of that, and that is the fund you were talking about, which we launched the 31st of March this year, two, week, two and a half weeks ago, that is a fund which is a sovereign green bond fund, which focuses uh, mainly on sovereigns. That's fresh, huh? <laughs> that, that's, that's very fresh. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, it's, it's, unique. Yeah. It's, it's also a unique fund because there's no government bond fund in the world focusing and measuring impact yet. So it's quite innovative. Can you describe who are your green bond investors? By and large, there are two different groups. One group are banks slash wealth managers. So for, for example, if you have a lot of money, and you go to a Dutch bank like Eben Amaro and you say, hey, yeah. I want to invest in a sustainable portfolio. They are offering you a portfolio of different sustainable investment funds. Mm. And one of those investment funds is quite often a green bond fund. Mm. So that is a very big group of part of our clients, predominantly in Europe. Next to that, there's also a lot of pension funds who uh, increasingly are allocating a part of their assets to a separate green bond portfolio or mandate. Mm -hmm. And we have at the moment several pension funds in our funds, but also several mandates. And yeah, that is also gaining quite a lot of momentum at the moment. So we are seeing more and more pension funds allocating money to green bonds. Is there interest in investing with you related to their passion about environmental outcomes versus finding solid fixed income strategies versus asset managers wanting to look green to the public? In the end, everybody investing in, in sustainable finance is welcome because it all helps. Yeah. But I think the first group of investors, which we saw in 2016 to 2018, clearly had the passion and the belief, I want to be green and do good. Because at that moment, there was no proof whatsoever that you could get a higher return. I think a lot of people were arguing that at that moment, investing in ESG and green means sacrificing return pretty clearly. Yeah. So it was a very conscious choice for those investors. I think since 2019 onwards, we are seeing actually a new group entering the green bond space as well. And those are more investors who maybe are not that convinced about the green part, but are just saying a little bit more, yeah, actually what you are saying, it seems to be hot, maybe a bit of window dressing to show that they're good. But most importantly, it, it, it's pretty clear that over the last couple of years that if you compare a green bond portfolio to a normal fixed income portfolio, the green bonds have been doing better and not worse. And that is something what more and more investors start to see and um, start to include when they are deciding on how to make investments in general. And, and then green bonds, yeah, they do pop up. 
Yeah, I want to be clear, I'm on your side, <laughs> but uh, I'm way older than you. I've seen a lot. So I, I understand that not everyone is there for the same reason. But all right, well, let's try to uh, drill down a little bit more now. Can you tell me in plain English what a green bond is, at least how you see it? And then what what is it that makes a green bond green as opposed to a bond bond or a James Bond, you know, or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, okay, and, well, and maybe, uh, maybe give me a couple real life examples to demonstrate the differentiating characteristics that makes them green. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, and, and that's very important to realize that a green bond in terms of liquidity, uh, legal status, uh, credit rating, the way it trades is exactly the same as a normal bond. I think that's very important to realize. <laughs> Where does it differ? It differs because the issuer commits to separate the proceeds of the bond to, uh, from the rest of the company and uses it only for predefined green projects. And those predefined projects, that can be everything, right? So those must be documented in advance. I think that's very important that it's very clear what it is they're going to use the money for. It's also very important, a very important part of the green bond structure is that once a year, that issuer reports back to the investor how the money has been used, what types of projects are being uh, financed, what the impact is of those projects financed. I think that's a very important part of the structure of a green bond, the reporting back to the investors, because in the end, it is a commitment and as yeah. an investor, you want to make sure that is really happening. So that's why this impact reporting is a very important part of the uh, green bond discussion. Right. So you have described in very plain English what I think commonly we talk about as ring fencing, which means that the proceeds are going to be very strictly controlled, right? So that's it's, the main differentiator between a regular bond that just is going to be used for general corporate needs. So yeah. can you give me a couple examples of corporate or sovereign use of proceeds that you see would qualify as a green bond versus something that's not? Yeah. I think if you look at the definition of green projects, of course, there is a little bit sometimes a debate going on. What yeah. exactly is a green project? Yeah. But there are some good international guidelines for this. The first one is the green bond principles from the ICMA. We also have the Climate Bond Initiative Taxonomy and currently the European Union Green Bond Standard is being developed. So there's mm -hmm. quite a lot of guidance for investors and also for issuers to figure out what is really a green legible project for my green bond. So that is something which we use also at NNIP to determine if a green bond really meets those international standards. Examples. Most of the green bonds are funding renewable energy projects, green buildings, or clean transportation projects. 80% of the green bonds are financing these type of projects. Renewable energy, rather straightforward most of the times. Mm -hmm. A utility company issues a green bond and they finance a windmill with it. Not much discussion about the greenness of those projects. Sometimes it can be a little bit more tricky. Think about big hydro projects. Think about gas, maybe. Is it green or not? Nuclear, is it green or not? So I think there's always a bit of gray area, and some kind of discussion, but for us, renewable energy is a rather straightforward project. One other example is the Dutch government. They issued a couple of green bonds. As a country in Netherlands, we are below the sea level. So yeah. a big part of that green bond is being used to build higher dikes, and to make sure that all the dams are being well maintained, which makes a lot of sense for us as a country. Belgium, for example, also issued green bonds. They have mainly used the proceeds to upgrade and build new train infrastructure. And trains already have been around for a long time, but I think the reality is still that the more trains there are, the more cars you indirectly are taking off the road. So I think these are uh, examples of projects which have been financed with the proceeds of green bonds. We always say money is fungible, right? And most of the people doing the issuance are typically large organizations 
or countries. But any organization is doing some things over here and doing some things over there. So one thing you just mentioned was power companies doing green, green and solar. But on the other hand, they may also be having either legacy coal-fired infrastructure or maybe continuing to yep. invest things in between. Maybe you can raise some money over here using green bond and maybe even at a lower coupon rate. Okay, we'll do that. And then go to the public market over here. Uh, so tell me, how good is this ring fencing, this, this, this control of the use of proceeds? How real is it? Yeah, I, I'm trying to get from the theory to how, how do you control that? Because we all know yeah. how things go. Yeah, I, I think that the ring fencing of the proceeds and allocating to the right projects, etc., is all quite okay. I don't think that there are a lot of unexpected things happening. It's most of the times very predictable what companies or treasuries are doing there. The question still remains, okay, Shell invests 20 billion in fossil fuels. They have uh, a 1 billion windmill park. And now they're going to issue a green bond to finance this windmill park, while at the same time still spending 20 billion in fossil fuels. Yeah. How credible is that? And I think that is really a little bit where it becomes uh, more challenging. And that's also why I think I have a job, because that is also within our green bond strategies are trying to do, we try to avoid greenwashing in the end, right? Yeah. So we want to make sure that whenever a green bond is being issued, there's alignment between the projects which they're financing and the broader strategy of the company. Mm. That's crucial, that's crucial. And that's also why we are saying that the greenness of a bond is not only determined by the projects which are being financed, but also by the broader ESG strategy of the company and their transition story and the targets which they're having. So that part is really very important. And, and again, that's why we think we have a role in the market to play to protect that green bond label. And that also means sometimes that we are rejecting green bonds because we think they're not green enough or not credible. I would not say the word greenwashing because in every country there's different standards and in the emerging markets the standards are different. We're just saying that we have high standards. And I think about from all the green bonds which we are monitoring globally, and I think currently that's around 800 green bonds, yeah. about 20% 20, 20 is not meeting our standards. And again, that does not mean that it's greenwashing, but it's just not meeting our dark green approach. And that, that's where we draw the line. So in the end, it's your standard. And in the end, there's no universal standard. Scott, this is probably also what you have experienced in the sustainable finance market. There's nowhere one definition. Yeah. Everybody has its own preferences. And in, in some countries like in Germany, they're phasing out all nuclear. But in China, they're building nuclear to replace coal and they save CO2 because you can't breathe in the cities there. Different environment and different country. And so there are different approaches and different standards in different countries. So how would you describe the attraction of green bonds for investors versus traditional bonds? I quite often also get the question, why would a company issue green bond in the first place? Because, you know, they would, you know, do those projects anyway. The way I see green bonds, it is the ultimate proof of what a company is doing. It's a transparency tool or product mm. because Unilever can say, hey, I have a sustainable living plan. I have the highest ESG rating in the world, but that could also just be because they have 20 people working on writing papers, policy papers. The question is, what are they really doing? And with a green bond, you really get transparency on the balance sheet of this issuer or company. You get insight in the projects and the way they work. And I think that is really the main function of the green bond market, proving what companies are really doing and saying. And that's also why blindly looking at ESG ratings, in my view, does not make sense at all. You don't go far enough, you have to go further. And that's why the whole use of proceeds concept for a green bond and actually also for a social bond is very powerful. And makes it also very tangible for a lot of investors because they can almost touch the projects. So they really 
get the idea that they're really contributing positively to those projects which they almost can touch. They can almost find them on the map and pointing at them, yes, I'm financing that project. And I think that is also what it makes it very attractive for, for a lot of investors. So you see it as providing more transparency into what they're really doing. Yes. But then I guess it depends on what they are really doing. Why is it more attractive? Is it just attractive from a transparency perspective? Or is there a performance aspect to it? Or is there so many other dimensions to it that if you had the choice between green bond and yeah. traditional bond, what would you do? Yeah, I think in the end, more transparency means lower risk. And in, in specifically for green bonds, that a company, if it is a credible green bond, is very seriously looking at climate risks tries to adapt him or herself to that and will have less risk on being involved in, for example, stranded assets. So I think the companies and issuers who are active in the green bond market are more forward-looking, more innovative, less exposed to climate and ESG risks, and therefore, from a risk point of view, more attractive. But I would also say from a return point of view, should perform better than companies who don't. So I think the I think I think that's really how we are seeing green bonds and the quantitative proof starting to become more and more in line with this philosophical view. And what does that mean? When you say the quantitative proof, like what the performance uh, has been better over the last couple of years for green bonds. The performance of the bonds in the market or the lower interest rate, or are you saying that the earnings performance of the company or yeah, so if you isolate a green bond index and you look at the yeah. green bond index and compare that to a regular fixed income index over the last seven years in euros, because that's the biggest part of the, the green bond market, mm -hmm. over the last seven years, on average, the green bond indices have performed 40 basis points per year better than a regular fixed income investment. For corporates, that's even higher, 60 basis points. So I think this is exactly also triggering less green focused investors into the market. But I think we should not care about that. We just want the green capital market to grow in the end. And we also need the regular normal investors for that. When you say 40 or 60 basis points better in the market, you're talking about the secondary market then? No, just if you compare, okay, you have a portfolio of green bonds, you invest in that, yeah, or you have the option to invest in a normal fixed income portfolio. So I'm not talking about specific individual bonds, because you're not making a trade-off between a green bond and a non-green bond when you invest in a portfolio of green bonds. Right. So if you make a separate allocation to green bonds at the expense of a regular fixed income allocation, same currency euro, then green bonds have been uh, doing better. So the answer is, if I understand this, what's the attraction? In order to do a green bond issuance, you end up having to be more transparent so an investor can see exactly what they're doing. And then by being able to have more transparency, you can better judge whether they're being forward looking and so forth. And as an investor, you have less risk. And if a company is more forward looking, they're likely to perform better. And as an investment, you just have more transparency and you're better able to judge who you're investing in and you're going to have a better outcome. Is that it? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that, that's absolutely it. Uh, the transparency aspect and the the innovative and better risk management from those companies compared to companies who don't. Yes. Yeah, but I guess green bonds aren't the only impact uh, oriented fixed income products. So uh, there might be other instruments that you invest in. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, at the moment still only managing the green bond portfolios. But I think uh, when you look at sustainable fixed income market, uh, the market is growing very quickly. So you also have now social bonds, sustainability bond, mm -hmm. sustainability link bonds. So the market is also very innovative in creating new products and new bonds. And yeah, there are, of course, climate is very important, but I think through this COVID-19 crisis, we've also seen that social and health issues are very important. So the social bond uh, market, for example, is also growing very quickly, but yeah. we don't have any products in that space uh, yet. So you're just purely doing green yeah, bonds? for the time being, right. yes. Okay. Would you see an advantage to green bonds versus other impact sustainable asset classes? I think one of the advantages, of course, is that it's, it's very liquid. If you look at the impact investing space and you have some alternative products in form of loans or mm. private equity, also hear that quite often. 
You can maybe go in and out once a month if you're lucky. Green bonds are tradable every day, they're liquid. And a lot of pension funds, they have very big allocation, allocations to regular bonds. So switching out of regular bonds into green bonds for them is low hanging fruit. Okay. So the liquidity aspect is uh, very important here. Uh, why this such an attractive instrument compared to those other forms of impact investing? And so this all sounds great. More transparency yeah. and, and more and more people are piling into it. Uh, we're going to get better returns. So as investors, are there any inherent risks or downside to investors with green bonds? Obviously, there's shared risks with the fixed income market in general. But are there other risks that are inherent to green bonds? And I don't know if there's things like failed third party yep. verifications. Or I, yep. I don't know. You know, tell me what the risk. Like, this just can't be all good news. Yeah, that's my sales pitch. Um, <laughs> no, but no, of course, there are risks. If you look at the size of the green bond market, it's still a small portion of the global fixed income markets. I think you're talking about uh, less than a couple of percentages. So. Of course, when I'm talking to investors, I say, yes, of course, you can replace regular fixed income with green bonds. But I'm also saying don't do everything because the market is small, is less diversified. So if you measure this against a regular fixed income index, you can have some deviations from time to time. That is a risk you must be aware of. So I think that is uh, yeah. something which I would not say downside risk, but it's one of the, the things to be aware of. The market is growing very quickly, but mm -hmm. it's still small. Yeah, also one other thing where we touched upon is the fact that everybody can issue a green bond. It's a self-labeled market. Yeah. So, you know, there's no formal law at the moment. The European Union is trying to implement regulation for that, but it's not there yet. So any, just like the most dirty company can issue green bonds if they have one small green project somewhere. Right. So you must do some additional work to make sure that those green bonds really have a positive impact. Because yes, there are airports issuing green bonds. Poland, <laughs> government of Poland, heavily dependent on coal, refusing to get into the European Union Green Deal, has issued quite a lot of green bonds. Mm. Russian Railways has issued green bonds while they, most of what they do is transport fossil fuels. So, you know, that's also one of the risks that there's risk of greenwashing and you need to allocate additional resources to filter those less green bonds out of your portfolio. Yeah. And are there potential conflicts of interest? I've understood some bonds or, or sustainability linked loans have ratchet mechanisms that investors get paid more when companies fail to hit their sustainability yeah. goals and all that. Are there potential conflicts of interest there? or perhaps the converse, uh, companies getting better interest rates by making targets that are very easy to obtain. Yeah, I, I know what direction you're getting to. That is uh, the discussion around sustainability linked bonds. Yeah. That's a relatively new instrument. Uh, that's not a green bond. So yeah. a sustainability linked bond is a normal bond where the issuer sets itself certain targets in the future. Yeah. And if they're not being met, they're being penalized by a higher coupon, which they have to pay for investors. Mm. That market is still in its infancy, far behind the green bond market, because it's really lacking standards at the moment. <laughs> Personally, I also think that the incentive is wrong. The structure we're talking about is companies are being punished if they are not achieving something. But I'm very much of the view it should be the other way around. You should reward companies if they achieve something positive. So. The the coupon should not step up, but should go down if they achieve something. Yeah. So there's still a lot of debate going on in, this, in that market, and it's very much in its early stage. In general, we are also seeing that issuers who are not able to issue a green bond, they go this route. So it is also saying something about those type of companies, I think. I'm not saying it's wrong, yeah. but I just think there's a lot of work to be done there. And at least I understand that that is what you're referring to here in this. Well, uh, yeah, just wanted to get your view. All right, now a $64 million question. How, how do you evaluate and quantify the social or environmental impact over the holding period? Because at the end of the day, that, that has to be the key thing that you make your decision on, right? Yeah, I think the challenge is that in terms of impact measurements, yeah, there's not one way of doing it at the moment, right? There's still quite a lot of debate going on how to do this. I also really want to 
yeah, emphasize that quantitative proof is not the only thing which you want as an investor. Because if you, for example, look at France, which runs exclusively on nuclear energy, and you're going to build a windmill there, your CO2 savings in general are being calculated against the average energy electricity in the country. And nuclear is, well, emitting zero CO2, but still by building this windmill, I think you're doing something good. Yeah. So we try to quantify as much as we can in our monthly reporting, but there's more than just the quantitative proof. I think uh, most investors, they really want to see the projects and also building dikes, for example, what, what we in Netherlands are doing, it's climate adaption. It doesn't save any CO2, yeah. but it's very much needed for us because I'm living at least uh, five meter below sea, sea level. And I think also your yeah. uh, nice uh, house in Amsterdam, I don't know which floor you're living, but if you're at the low floor, <laughs> you probably... Uh, we, we, we have uh, some protection, but uh, that won't help us get to the Albert Hein. <laughs> yeah, but I think that those kind of projects are also needed. And that's also part of what is possible under a green bond a use of proceeds program. And yeah, that does not, yeah, how to calculate CO2 saving, savings on a diet you're building. I don't know, but it, I think it is needed. And I think it should be part of uh, a green bond uh, use of proceeds concept. So you, you mentioned that there's no one way to analyze it. Did you mean like within NNIP, you don't have one way that you do it? Or do you have your own way that you apply fairly consistently that it differs from others? Yeah. So we have our screening at the moment we buy a bond based on international standards. So climate bond initiative, European Union green bond standards. We apply that as much as possible to select projects which we think are really green. Then once we have invested our portfolio, we report to our investors what the impact is. And the impact is based on all the impact re reporting we are getting from all those green bond issuers. We aggregate them on a portfolio level. We critically look at all those numbers and align them as much as possible. But here there are lots of challenges because if you build a windmill, some issuers, they're calculating it against an average in a country. Some others, they're calculating it, the CO2 savings compared to, for example, fossil fuels or coal electricity generation. Then it always looks much better, of course. So a different, there are different ways of calculating it. And we are always trying to streamline them and only include those numbers and methodologies which are credible in our view. You said you evaluate them against standards. You mentioned EU Green Bond and the Climate Bond Standard. Do you use the same ones or do you require that they meet one or more or two or more? Or does it depend on the project? Our own Green Bond framework is based on all those standards. And we are picking from the standards the best parts, we think at least, and put that in our own Green Bond framework. So we have parts of the Green Bond principles. We have parts of the Climate Bond Initiative taxonomy and we have parts of the EU taxonomy also in our Green Bond framework. But we do not agree with everything was in those taxonomies. We have sometimes our own views uh, on top of that. And that's how we have created our own Green Bond framework. So in the end, it's a proprietary framework you created. It is, now. it is. And, and I think that's also go, going back a little bit to the discussion we had in the beginning. In the end, what is sustainable differs from person to person and from country to country. From the other hand, I have to say, if you compare green bonds to alternatives in sustainable finance, like sustainable credits or sustainable equity, I think there's no liquid market, which is so far in agreement on what it is compared to sustainable equity, for example, because what's sustainable equity? Yeah. There are even more definitions of that, I think, and it's even more challenging. So there are two sides of the story, I think, here. I guess we can't have a conversation about green bonds without bringing up the term greenwashing, which you uh, already alluded to. I've heard the term many times, but can you explain to me what is greenwashing for you and how does it affect this sector and how do you and NNIP deal with it? Yeah, let me think. It's such a straightforward term, actually, that I have to think about the definition, but I think it is companies pretend to do good while at the same time, the bulk of their business or operations is not good, not doing good at all. So you're giving a misleading signal to the market. 
And again, I think that is for us something what, what we really try to, to filter out. That is, I think, one of the USPs which we are giving to investors. And how do we do that? We don't look only at the green projects which are being financed, but also taking consideration the broader strategy or the broad direction of the company. I think that's really crucial to avoid greenwashing. When a new green bond is being issued and we see it from day one that it's not meeting our standards, we flag it as non-green and we are not allowed to buy it. Sometimes it also happens that we have a bond in our portfolio uh, which finances nice windmills, but the company suddenly starts to do something non-green, something very yeah. dirty. That can happen. It doesn't happen too often, but it, it, the risk is, of course, always there. A company can also change course. When that happens, we have a formal process in place to first start engaging with this company. If this does not help, we downgrade the green bond to non-green and we sell it from our portfolios. And I think that is also something which probably shows that we are on top of everything. And you have to keep on screening those green bonds, not only at the moment you buy them, but also once you have them in the portfolio, you have to remain critical and you have to keep on monitoring how those proceeds are being used, but also what the company is doing. Obviously, it comes down to a definition. You refer to your standards all the time, but what are those standards? And, and for example, is something like a generation for nuclear power plant something that's considered? green energy or not? That's a, there's lots of different views on that part, but so we are working with the different external providers to give us input. So for example, we were work with uh, Sustainalytics, with ISS, uh, with MSCI. We use all those sources of input for us to do our analysis. We also look at sign-based targets, for example, and we all, by combining all those pieces of information and meeting the issuer in person, we get a fairly good impression how credible the green bond is and what direction the company is heading to. In terms of nuclear energy, it's a bit of a mixed view. I think we do not invest in companies building new nuclear plants. That is formally being excluded from our green bond portfolios. But I also would say that it's not really by definition bad nuclear. So. I'd rather phase out all coal at the expense of nuclear than shutting down all nuclear and building coal plants instead. <laughs> but relative to this, do you actively engage with uh, bond issuers? And if so, how do you do that? I think we have uh, per year close to 100 uh, meetings with mm -hmm. issuers, uh, green bond issuers. Yeah. Uh, we, try, we try to uh, meet them, all our green bond issuers, at least once every two years, two years, quite often, more often. But yes, it's a crucial part of our investment process, meeting them, being able to ask more questions than just a formal question through the phone or through the documentation you're reading. You always get a lot of information. I got one other quick one. Uh, I, it's a bugaboo I have in the whole financial services industry, and it's the prolific yeah. use of acronyms and labels that are thrown around 14 ways yeah. come Sunday. Yeah. So with the growth of the green bond industry, I've seen a multitude of labels types of fixed income products, green bonds, social bonds, sustainability linked bonds, TCFB, ICMA, GBP yeah. principles, all this stuff. In your opinion, do you think that this increases a risk of confusion or dilution for management? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's, it's sometimes it's really a nightmare with all this regulation in Europe coming at, at us. So last year we had to, for our sustainable funds, we had to apply for the Belgium Fablefin label. Well, there was a lot of hassle to get it done. We got that done. Now in France, we're going through exactly the same exercise. In Europe, you has, have the SFDR classification for funds. So we try to align with that as well. So it almost operationally becomes such a big burden that it, yeah, it takes so much of our time and, and effort. And in the end, you can wonder, hey, why do we have to, to be in line with all those different regulations? Can't there be more centralized regulation than you just uh, be in line with one. So it's very much a big burden. Uh, on top of that, I fully agree with the, all the different things thrown, thrown at, at us. How do you know what's real and what, what's not? And that could be a risk for the sustainable finance market. I also tried to push back some of the labels which are being invented at the moment. So yeah. the green bond label, you also have a transition bond label. It's ridiculous. 
You have the sustainability <laughs> linked on paper with building this instant system. Yeah. We also try to steer the market a little bit in, in the direction, okay, it's good, but let's not over innovate because then you push people away again. So yeah. we have to, to balance uh, between the two, I think. The next 10 years could be the most important decade that may determine the long-term health of the planet. What do you realistically think the fixed income investment community will achieve by the end of the decade, by 2030? I, I think in the end, when you look at the different asset classes in the past, when people were talking about sustainable finance, they were mainly talking about equity. It mm. seems now with all this labeling going on and all this yeah, sustainable finance innovations in the fixed income market, it seems that fixed income finally gets up to the same level as we already were uh, in the equity space. And I think in 2030, I at least hope that we are at the same level. Yeah, of course, potentially even better. So we are hoping that in 2030, that's our long-term projection, 25 to 30% of the fixed income market should be sustainable or labeled, however you want to put it. If you had to name the one most important challenge right now in the green bond space at this time, what would it be? It's what we discussed before. It's it's the label mania, as I call it. The, the, <laughs> okay. the over-innovation in the labeled bond okay. market. What do you know now about green bond investing that you wish you knew in 2015 when you showed up at NNIP? Good question. Well, I never expected the market to grow that fast in such a time, short time period. Can you describe to me an example of a deal that you were convinced at the time you invested that it ticked all your boxes, met all your requirements, but in the end it didn't turn out and went pear-shaped? And what did you learn from that? Yeah, so there was one bank um, in India issued a green bond, which we bought in our portfolios. End of last year, we learned that they were about to finance the biggest open pit coal mine in the world, in Australia. <laughs> oh, God. And then we just downgraded them to non-green solid out from our portfolios. I think, yeah, the one thing you we really learned from this is that emerging markets is a different world than developed markets in terms of transparency and credibility for sustainable finance. They're way behind. And if someone wants to get into sustainable, responsible investing in the fixed income green bonds space, how would you advise them to get into the business and where would be the best place for them to cut their teeth? Whenever we are hiring people, for example, what is most important is a personal enthusiasm and belief in ESG and green. For me, that comes first. If you don't have that, then working as a green bond or sustainable finance professional is probably not the right place to be. Mm. And where to, when you say cut your teeth, I think in the Netherlands and France, they're great places to start your career in sustainable finance. It's going global, but I think here in the Netherlands and also other parts of Europe, we are still quite far ahead compared to the rest of, of the world. I'm not saying it in an arrogant way. I, I think <laughs> it's pretty realistic. I think the Dutch pension funds, they also have been quite advanced already for years and also quite focal. So I think this is a good place to uh, to start your career, actually. Ram, thanks so much for taking the time to speak. It's been great to get to know you a little more and to hear what you've had to say. And maybe one of these days when I'm back in uh, Amsterdam, we'll have a small glass somewhere. Thanks very okay. much. Have a okay, good weekend. Thanks, uh, yeah, thank yeah, you. Cheers, bye. Cheers. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do me a favor and hit the like button and subscribe to receive future episodes. You can find more interviews, articles, and information on sustainable and responsible investing at our website, SRI360.com. If you enjoyed this interview and you would like to read more lessons learned from world-class SRI investors, get yourself a copy of my book, Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360 Degrees. It's a must read for anyone wanting to know more about investing for positive social, environmental, and ethical impact, all with market returns. These are the stories and tactics of those leading the way as sustainable and responsible investing goes mainstream. Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360 Degrees is now available in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook format wherever books are sold.